This story isn't as scary as most I've heard on the podcast but as a high school kid, it was a pretty stressful time. I apologize if this seems to run on but I hope it's at least entertaining. It feels good to write it down. I'm from a small town in Ontario, Canada. At the time of this story, I was in 11th grade. So that would make me about 16 or 17. In school my group of friends fell somewhere in the neutral zone of the social hierarchy. We got along with most, but kept our immediate circle fairly tight. There was only one particular group that I didn't see eye to eye with. This group was generally found by the smokers area or in the shop classes, subsequently they were the reason I avoided taking these classes. They were the underachieving, partying type that cared more about looking tough and edgy. They really bothered us. It was just known we weren't on good terms for no explainable reason. Chalk it up to high school social logic I guess. Through some mutual friends, my best friend, John, and I were introduced to three ninth grade girls. We'll call them Kennedy, Alex, and Lauren. Although Alex and Lauren were drooling over John basically from the start, Kennedy and I hit it off quite quickly as well. The only downside to our blooming romance seemed to be that her brother happened to be in the one group in school that we didn't get along with. We'll call him Brandon. Despite our obvious interest in each other, that didn't stop my awkward self from taking months to ask her out. That awkwardness ended up being the theme of the relationship. We had a handful of shy pecks on the lips, a little hand holding, and a few cute moments at school dances. The most intense part of our relationship was the overdramatic poems we exchanged between classes. This was before texting was common, so notes were the communication of choice when between classes. Well, after a short three months, we decided the relationship wasn't working and we were better off friends. To be clear, this is one of those instances where we actually did stay friends. Unfortunately, this seemed to put targets on John's and my back. The relationship slash friendship had put us in the sights of Kennedy's brother and his friends for some reason. However their scare tactics were rather harmless. It mostly consisted of them muttering simpleton insults like faggot and light shoves into lockers. Enough to make it known they had a problem with us but not enough to take to any authorities. Eventually, they became a bit braver. John was unlucky enough to be in an outdoor education class with some of Brandon's friends. This class, as its name suggests, consisted of a few wilderness outings. One particular overnight winter trip, the class was sleeping in a large cabin. This cabin had a long hallway lined with rooms stocked with bunks to be shared by the students. John was in a room with some other students, close to falling asleep, when Brandon's friends flung the door open, whipped a snowball at John and ran for it. Without thinking, John jumped out of bed, made a new snowball out of the debris, stepped out the door to the hallway, and threw the snowball at the retreating boys. The projectile hit one of the boys square in the back of the head and fell to the floor. The boy's ego was hurt more than his head though, and the group came back to enact revenge. They roughed John up a bit but nothing serious. When he returned to the room, his friend Sam was awake and asked what happened. Sam is one of the nicest guys I've ever met but can also be pretty intimidating when provoked. When he was informed of what had happened, he stormed into their room. Threw one of the guys against the wall and promised some harsh consequences if they touched John again. There were no more issues on that trip. Things were pretty uneventful until springtime. One weekend morning, I came downstairs and my parents told me our house had been egged and our lawn had been torn up by a vehicle. My parents asked me if I knew anyone who would do this. I said I might but in my mind I was 99% sure. Monday morning, John informed me the same happened to his house and that solidified it for me. I asked Kennedy if she knew where her brother was Friday night. She said he was out with his friends all night, but I had no solid proof to get him or his friends with. Not long after the first incident, John's lawn gets hit again in the night. John's dad takes this as a sign it might possibly keep happening and he started staying up as a lookout. It's only a couple nights before Brandon shows up again but John's dad isn't quick enough to get a plate number. He didn't give up though, John's dad stepped up his game in preparation for the next visit. John's yard had sort of a second driveway that entered their yard. Used mostly for the riding lawn mower with a trailer to transport things around the sizable yard. This is where Brandon was gaining access. John's dad laid down a makeshift spike strip across this path and waited for Brandon's next attempt. His work wasn't in for nothing, as just a few nights later. Brandon returned and just as expected he immediately hit the spike strip and tried to make an escape. John's dad was easily able to get a plate number and called the police. 
they picked him up not long after. Brandon was found to be driving with only a G1 license. For those who don't know, a G1 only allows you to drive while accompanied by a fully licensed driver. So, among other charges, his license was also suspended and his vehicle was seized. It was found that Brandon was accompanied, at least during the first attacks, by two friends. They'll be called Mark and Victor for this story. I had actually gone to school with Mark and Victor since grade one and never had any issues with them, but peer pressure does wonders for one's judgment. Our parents agreed to not press charges, under the agreement that we all take part in a restorative circle to be scheduled at a later date. This is basically where all people involved and their parents sit down with a mediator and resolve any conflict. In classic bully fashion, Brandon sees his misfortunes as our vault. As if he couldn't believe we had the audacity to get the police involved or retaliate at all. Of course, John and I didn't actually even inflict any of this on him. Our parents did. We were the easiest target for the blame though. Friends of Brandon's I had never even conversed with before were now slinging insults as well. I had gym class with a couple of guys from this group. They not so subtly mentioned they heard I know martial arts and asked if that was true. As if they were just being friendly. I had no such training. They had mistaken me for another friend of mine. I went along with it though, as I knew they were sizing me up. All we could do is wait for the restorative circle and hope for some semblance of a resolution, before one of them got brave enough to do something. After days of tension, I was at my limit and frankly annoyed. One of Brandon's friends, one that was part of the snowball incident, passed John and I in the hallway by the office muttering that familiar word, faggot. His ignorant voice rang through my head and I saw red. I spun around on the spot and yelled the first thing that came to mind, which was, get a fucking dictionary, dumbass. He did a 180 and headed straight toward me. What did you say, he said in his most threatening voice. You heard me. I replied in the most confident voice I could muster. I thought for sure I was about to have my first fist fight right here in front of the school office. Right then, the secretary stepped out the door and screamed at all of us to step inside. Fortunately no punishments were given but we felt even less safe. John ended up going home early but my parents didn't see it necessary. Fortunately for me, I had a pretty busy schedule. When I wasn't in school, I was usually at the rink for figure skating practice. So there were little to no opportunities for Brandon and his friend to jump me without consequences. John managed to keep a low profile as well until the restorative circle. When the date finally came for the mediation, it was mostly uneventful. Mark and Victor apologized profusely. This wasn't surprising as I knew their parents would not be okay with this. I carried very little anger for them though, as I knew they were basically bystanders. Brandon, on the other hand, had no remorse. He even tried to reason that he was getting back at me for pressure Kennedy into sex. Which as I stated before, was not even close. We never got an apology from him but he did understand that he would be facing charges if he tried anything else against. So luckily we never had any more problems, besides their usual insults. I wish I had a better ending to this story but at least they were caught and they faced some consequences. I guess you have to take the little wins sometimes. Some karma that came out of this situation. About a year after this incident, I ran my mom's car into a ditch. The same officer that dealt with that case, responded to the scene. He recognized me and chose not to apply any reckless driving charges. As he remembered, I was, a good kid, in his words. About ten years after this incident, John's dad has a rental property that he needs plumbing work done on. He has a company come out for a quote, and who else shows up but Brandon. John's dad recognized him immediately, let him assess the extensive work, and then absolutely went with a different company. So, my husband has this best friend that he's known since they were kids. I've also known Eric for a few years, as long as I've been married. Eric lives a little ways out of one of the main parts of our rural county. He lives on a beautiful 60-acre green, hilly farm. It's super quiet out there, all you can really hear at night are the frogs in the pond and the crickets sprinkled around the farmlands. One particular night, as the moon was shining bright over the grassy hills, Eric got ready for bed as usual. He pretty much fell asleep as soon as his head hit the pillow and slept quite deeply. He awoke around sunrise and noticed a slight itch in his ear, but he soon fell back to sleep for a few more hours. But, when he woke up again a few hours later, he noticed that he kind of had a slight, prickly feeling earache. 
He sat up in bed and tried to clear the grogginess and sleepiness from his head for a minute. He headed for the bathroom to relieve himself and as he did, he thought he felt a light scratching in his right ear, the same ear from earlier that itched. Need to trim those damned ear hairs, he thought to himself. After he finished with the toilet duty, he paused at the sink to splash his face with some cold water. As he dried his face, he happened to glance at his tired reflection in the mirror and he thought he caught a quick glimpse of movement from his right ear. He turned on the bathroom light and peered closely at his ear in the mirror. Then, to his absolute horror, he watched a pair of antenna waves back and forth as they poked out of his ear. Then he began to panic as a tiny head followed the antenna. He felt nauseous by the time the slender, elongated body of a pincher bug or earwig crawled out, pinchers and all. Eric's knees went weak and sweat began to drip down his forehead. As soon as the critter started crawling down his cheek, he screamed and slapped it off himself. After squashing the bug about a million times, he ran outside for a smoke. He smoked and calmed himself down, thinking that was the end of that, but he was wrong. A few months later, the same thing happened to poor Eric again. Only the next time, he woke up before the creepy crawler could invade his ear again. I did do a tiny bit of research on pincher bugs, aka earwigs and there aren't really any documented cases of any of the insects actually crawling into human ears and laying eggs in the brain like the old wife's tale suggests. I'm just glad that I wear earplugs to bed. I just started remembering what it was like being 9 years old. My son, Wyatt, is the same age now. He's my only kid, and he's a gentle and curious boy. Which is why I worry this whole thing is about to go horribly wrong. I was tough, but I think my parents' divorce was what set it off for me. I didn't see it coming, and wasn't prepared for being alone in our big house with just my mom. But dad had to leave, so it was just us. Everything felt different after he left. Especially my room. It always felt like there were sets of eyes following me from under the bed to the closet. And then back again. I'd walk past the closet and see movement in my peripherals, but I'd never turn fast enough to catch it. The incidents in the closet grew over time. It'd be every three or four nights. Sometimes six. Sometimes ten. Just long enough for me to hope the thing wasn't coming back. But then I'd be lying in bed, and a coat hanger would twist and squeak. Or a toy block would tumble or pages in a book would flip. One night my closet door slowly creaked open. I pulled the covers down and finally saw what it was. My scream shook the town and my mom was in my room in under five seconds flat. She'd been awake and trying to drink herself to sleep down the hall. My mom checked the closet but found nothing. I convinced her to let me sleep in her bed that night, but she was adamant it wouldn't become a habit. I knew I couldn't stay in my room anymore. And didn't really want to stay in the house. But I didn't like the idea of that thing in my room. Or near my mom. So the next night, I made a plan and spent the whole day preparing. It was shortly after midnight when my closet door creaked open. A tall, impossibly long-limbed figure ducked out from under the frame of the closet and into my room. It moved awkwardly, like a man unable to fully control his limbs. His body and head were tiny, reminding me of daddy long-leg spiders. The man had to curl under the ceiling as he approached my bed. He leaned over the tiny mound under the blankets, and peeled them back to reveal. Clothes, strategically placed to resemble my body. And in the center, a knife pointed upwards, taped to a mechanical toy trebuchet. Its trigger pin had a long string attached to it, which ran off the bed and behind the dresser, along the wall. And to a mound of clothes in the corner. Which I was hidden in. I tricked it. I pulled the string and the pin yanked out. The trebuchet snapped forward and the knife swung up, slamming into the tall man's face. He stumbled backwards, falling into the closet and pulling the door shut behind him. I climbed out of my hunting blind with a hockey stick I'd taped a flashlight to and another one of my mom's knives to the end of. I opened the closet, ready to jab forward, but it was empty. I turned on the ceiling lights and found a trail of strange dark blood from my bed to the middle of the closet. The blood disappeared in the middle of the floor. I cleaned the blood up with bleach and left the light on for the rest of the night. Then I moved to the second part of my plan. Our family were big campers and I'd watched my dad set up the tent plenty of times. I loved sleeping outside under the stars and convinced my mom to let me sleep in the backyard in the tent for the week. The week turned into a month. And that turned into three months. 
I spent the entire summer in the tent. When my mom made me finally come in and sleep in my room again. My closet was normal. The tall man never came back. I eventually stopped thinking about him and grew up. I didn't think of the man again until my wife and I went to a parent-teacher meeting. Wyatt was kept separate from it. The teacher, Mrs. Boyle, thought Wyatt was a great kid. Very intelligent and kind. With an expansive imagination. His creativity had typically produced very diverse work. But the past few weeks, things had changed. He'd only been drawing one thing. It was a stick figure of a frightening, distorted-looking man. Who was very tall. The man's arms and legs were long. Too long for the tiny head and body which were made up of small swirls and spikes. Wyatt had written, Mr. Daddy Long Legs, on all of the drawings. My heart skipped a beat and I felt like I was nine again. Apparently, Wyatt was speaking with Mr. Daddy Long Legs constantly in class. I didn't remember anything else that was said in the meeting. It was like I went deaf. My wife and I picked Wyatt up from the adjacent classroom after. It was a quiet walk to the car, and an even quieter drive. From the back seat, Wyatt finally broke the silence. He asked if Mrs. Boyle brought up the drawings. I said she did bring them up. Then asked Wyatt, who the man in the drawings was. Wyatt told me, you know who he is. You met him before. I lied and responded, I don't remember meeting him. Wyatt leaned forward in his seat, up to my shoulder, and whispered, he remembers meeting you.